So my name is Dennis Cooley. I I have to always think, what the heck is my role in this particular thing? And it's multiple on this one. So I am the director of the Northern Plains Ethics Institute and also the chair of the School of Humanities at NDSU. Uh, I wanna thank our sponsors, Dakota Digital Academy, this uh, College of Arts and Sciences, Tri-College University, the School of Humanities and the NPEI. I think I've got them all. Uh, what we're doing is we're, this is a part of a series of programming on artificial intelligence and humanities. It will continue for the entire uh, academic year. So we're kicking off with Chancellor Hagerot because Chancellor Hagerot is an expert historian in the area and he also understands where we need humanities to come in on uh, AI. So what he's got is a, an enormous amount of information. Um, he is willing to stay here until 1.30 if you have additional right. questions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I unfortunately have to go to a meeting that he has arranged for me for <laughs> NUS <laughs> at 12.50. Just to know, I volunteer to serve on his committee. So he's kind of my boss on it. No. <laughs> <laughs> at the end of this. Um, but I want to I want to give an introduction. He just gave a talk for my class and it brought a student over from it to hear more about what we have here. So Mark Higara is the chancellor of the NDUS uh, system, which has 11 institutions in it. He is a, a from North Dakota, but of course he returned here uh, after serving in the, the Navy. He has is on a multiple number of boards, including the Navy Education Board Advisable. that is thinking about this topic right now for the military. So he has an enormous amount of background. He is asked to discuss this not only in the area but nationally and internationally so what you're seeing is a compression of an enormous amount of material he likes to answer questions but what we're going to do is the first 40 minutes or so he's going to give the talk then we'll open to questions as i said he's willing to go to 1 30 i'm hoping my dean will be here until 1 30 so that she can where's your dean take that's kimberly wallen thank you for sponsoring this um so she could take over when i have to go at 12 50. but anyways let's welcome our speaker so yeah i i struggle with the words to describe the magnitude of what's happening um and dennis had me here four years ago in 2019 when we speculated about this stuff never did I think I'd have to change the brief the way I've had to change it now in four years. Um, and eventually I will drive this, this model here. And, and Patrick is the publisher of the Dakota Digital Review. Um, and he basically directed me, come on in, Jake, there's a seat right here. The two entrepreneurs, please, there's two seats. I'm glad to see some wealth creators here. <laughs> Brian Ragus and uh, Jake Jorstad, who are building part of the world and uh so I, I wanted to be here so we got academics we've got one of my bosses here by the way mr biller who is working on the envision 2030 digitization thing so he will have a significant role i'm not trying to pressure you of 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 literally what we do as a state potentially getting resources i don't want to say what he and dr armakos could say but i think i hope it will be this is so big we need more money fast uh that might be one of the, one of the conclusions you have but he's leading that group. Um, we're on the humanities group for Envision 2030. And part of it was what do humanities mean in the age of AI and ethics? And, and uh, Dr. Wallace, thank you for thinking about maybe adding, you know, some more classes on technology. But what I'll basically derive this, this model here of a way to look at the world. Patrick said, we got to copyright that. He's never seen anything like that. Um, and and you can see it's represented by three things the world of humans and nature which is how the built world was built for fifteen thousand so years that's lower left and then the emergence of, of advanced machines steam engines railroads planes and now robotics elon musk is a robot company which i know you you identified he was the first one telling me elon musk is not a car company he is a robot company uh, and, and then the metaverse cyber space. It wasn't called the metaverse until 2021 when Zuckerberg rolled it out. Maybe people debate the word, but literally an entirely virtual world and how these will exist with or without us. Uh, because there are theorists who think AI will just communicate with robots in itself. And this is the movie Her with Wacom Phoenix. Anybody see that movie? In the end, it is a profound 
point that in the end, the machines just talk to the machines. We're too boring for them, okay? And that would be some of those overlaps where we're not there. And then obviously a very value-laden statement, I'm saying, but I'll back it up with some historical stuff of that box I call the AI AGI control box and none other than, you know, probably a future Nobel Prize winner, Stuart Russell, his leading book on AI, and he's been knighted by the queen, he has the word, the problem of control, okay? So it's not just me going off the reservation. It's like, how do we control this so that your IP isn't stolen, right? And destroy your company, you know? So so that's where we're going to go. Um, but I tried to boil it down um, to some specific statements because there's a lot of slides. So I've got a page. So there's one page of some specific statements. Next slide. So we are entering a time when literally technology is creating new realms of the world. And it's been coming for several hundred years. And I'll show you this. The capacity of artificial intelligence to extend life, create wealth is going to be eye popping. And I have a quote of one of the estimates of what it will be. And the militaries are going to be super empowered. China is in a full on arms race. Um, and Putin has said, whoever wins this will control the world. Full stop. Um, but now what's happened is the technology will have so much power that humans before used to be protected by just the limits of machines, right? Um, but now it literally will, will penetrate that space. I think China has fully agreed that it will completely engulf that. They are becoming the surveillance society. There, there will be no privacy in China. So that, that graph that you humanities and lawyers may fight for, I think in China, they've made a decision. Their surveillance technology and automation will literally absorb all of that. Um, in America, I don't think we want that. But um, human intelligence is now being supplanted. And if you saw in the little blurb I had, literally a human-centric world of intelligence is passing away. It'll now be co-occupied. That's a big thing. Um, but in the end, that means we'll be well programmers. And none other than uh, Brockman, and my, one of my bosses here went there, but I took four pages of notes of Brockman. He was in Grand Forks yesterday, a North Dakota kid is the co-founder of AI, but I'm told he had a bunch of bodyguards to get there. I mean, this is how big this is getting, okay? But he said, what we are hoping to do is program AI to be good. Um, but I believe we will need policy, law, ethics, and norms, and human shaping. And he said the same, he goes, this is not on us alone. He was kind of saying, I can't be responsible for this alone. We are all in this. And this is one of the things that several people here know, and my boss knows, we, are, we have now and the most significant, with Dr. Fitzgerald's help, partnership with North Dakota, South Dakota, Montana, Wyoming, Idaho, the Northern Plains Mountains Innovation Alliance, to try to get to scale, not just on advanced research, and she's doing great work, but also um, a lot of money is going to go to ethics, um, human issues, sociology, but we have to be at scale to compete for that. And I want to thank her for helping on that, but that was just penned last fall. And Senator Hoban is trying to get us over the hump on the actual designation federally for that so we can have a voice. Next slide. So the brief will be laid out of kind of just highlight on some developments. Um, so I'd ask uh, Dr. Pringle not to correct me. You can correct me later, okay, when I say some things about AI. Okay, just hold that. <laughs> Very rudimentary. Um, then offer a framework of how to situate us as we grapple with this, because this is so big. This is beyond any technologist. Um, and then I'll offer a strategy of resilience, which my boss has already kind of seen that. So you'll have seen that in May. I talk because it really is the only way I think forward because there's so many unknowns that you just got to be resilient at a human level. Uh, this means the bullying, which the governor, I give him credit. He had Nicholas Carlisle brief at his uh, Innovate Educate. I thought it was going to be a thing about a new app. The guy was talking about human mental health and what technology is doing to young women. And they're becoming brittle and vulnerable. So I was encouraged by using this resilience thing. Um, and last thing I'll say is truly, I believe the people alive right now are the most important ever in the history of this, this, you know, depending on how long you think humans have been here, because you're now having to going to share the planet with people. And because of this theory, which I'll show you, I think I've got it in here. Um, now I might've taken that out. I kept it in for the class, but there's a theory of technological momentum that the decisions we make now literally have a habit of locking in things. And as all you have to look at your QWERTY keyboard and you'll see, we still use the QWERTY keyboard. And that was laid down in the late 1860s, 1870s because of the Remington typewriter. 
and we live with it today. Least inefficient. Yeah, right, the least inefficient, yeah. Designed to slow right. us down. Exactly, they, they designed it because those are all, remember, the keys locking, and they never could break away once all the typing schools had and all the manuals. So what this generation does, literally when they write the books, um, and there's a book it's like called a, a top Anonymous History, because they realize, you know, a president can only do so much, Bill Gates can only do so much. What were all the engineers, technologists, people doing that we don't have time to name them all, but they themselves, they're responsible for what happened, okay? Um, and so with, because of this theories of momentum, we really got to get this more right than wrong. Um, and I, you know, actually I do have one slide that might mention that later. Okay, next slide. So this has been anticipated a long time. I mean, literally for 200 years, like, I th we think this is coming. We think this is coming. And you're now alive when basically what Brockman said yesterday is it will happen. And that is artificial generalized intelligence. Um, so the Luddite rebellion, how many know who the Luddites were? You heard that? Okay. So the Luddites were the working people, the families that worked in their homes when the first milling machines came out and there was no social safety net. There was no unemployment. There was no welfare and they were being destitute. So they went to parliament and said, can you help us? We know this is coming. Give us some protections. And the British Parliament was so dominated by the aristocracy and the big, you know, Watts and Boltons that they literally arrested these people, the moderates. And so the radicals then around this guy named Ned Ludd took over. And it was the single biggest British Army occupation in the history of, of modern Britain to control this. And they made it a capital offense to break a machine. They hung people and shot people for damaging machines. And as all it did then is it made ludism a word around the world because of the, the severity of this. Well, the Washington Post just came out after 20 entrepreneurs all went to Washington, D.C. last week. They were all there. If you've seen it, it was incredible. You had Elon Musk, you had Gates, you had Zuckerberg. I mean, everybody was there. And Washington Post, which is owned by Bezos, said, um, we all are going to have to be Luddites a little bit, meaning thinking about human welfare here. Um, we're going to have to be very conscious about it. So that happened in 1811. And then several things, this guy named Samuel Butler in 1871, he predicted basically superintelligence and the crisis of how to stabilize societies. Um, anybody here a medical doctor? Anybody medical? It was funny, he, he singled out doctors as the one who had to be the most careful because they would begin to modify humans. It was very interesting, he anticipated transhumanism. Um, uh, Turing, of course, famous, famous guy who then developed the Turing test, which people now believe we may have just passed with the chat GPT-3, but also he was the first to basically use words that means the singularity, that uh, machine intelligence will exceed us. So Turing truly wrote some of the most important papers ever. Asimov, the iRobot movie doesn't do justice. The last couple paragraphs, he anticipates this, and then humans pondering, well, can we even challenge the machine? Because it knows more than we do. Um, the digital computer in 45, uh, the concept of AI was at a conference in New Hampshire, like well, they first coined the word artificial intelligence. The first villainizing of the machine itself. Anybody seen Space Odyssey 2001? A couple people, okay. HAL is just basically IBM shifted one letter. Um, if you can believe this, I, I flew back to, to DC to visit my uh, granddaughter and Delta picks which movie should be most popular. This was back up on the new releases. <laughs> They put the 1968 Space Odyssey because there was that much demand for it. And I did since people on plane were watching it. Um, Internet came out in 1969. This is so current. If you can believe it, I'm on the Navy Advisory Board for Education, along with the president of Ohio State, um, the president of Princeton. So very honored that North Dakota, but I'm a Navy guy and, and they wanted a, a Navy veteran. Neither one of them um, were veterans. Um, I sat next to the guy that typed and created TCP protocol. Vincer sat right next to me. I almost wanted to take a photo of his hands because, I mean, this is the human hands that, that actually got this thing going. He's still alive. And he volunteered. He's on the board of Google. He says, this is so important for the military. I'm going to be here. And I'm right now working on an article for the Dakota Digital Review. And we invite any bit of you on to write in this. Um, Patrick is holding the presses because Vince Cerf said something like, I'm beginning to wonder if the biggest issue now is human control. He said it, and I'm see if he'll let me quote him, you know, in, in the article. Um, of course, we might remember where we were when IBM beat uh, Ken Jennings, was that his name, right? I mean, the smartest guy in the America was beaten, obliterated by the machine. And uh, 
Dr. Pringle will tell you it wasn't that big of a thing. It was just lots of stuff. But then ChatGP went public. It's so shocking that Bronkman said it yesterday. He said, we thought maybe about 500 people would use this. A yeah, days. a million in five days, the fastest growing app ever. And he used the example like, we have no idea how fast this is going, where this is going. When all these experts who are now all billionaires thought, eh, let it go out there over Christmas and see what we get. So nobody really gets what's going on. And the last thing, if you want, how unprecedented it is the actors and writers haven't struck together since I was born. UAW has never struck against three companies at the same time. And all of this is about automation, AI, and their rights going forward. Anybody seen the recent um, uh, Indiana Jones movie? Have you seen the recent one? There's so many. They use an avatar construction of, of um, Harrison Ford for about the first 20 minutes of the movie. This is what the actors are talking about. You need to hire new actors and re redo the series and quit bringing him back uh, because then Warner Brothers gets all the profits, right? You know, um, or Time Warner, whatever it is. So these are some statements and these are some of the uh, events that we are now living and why motivating everybody here of just how incredible it is to be here now at that point, 112 years later, that as Bronkman said yesterday, it, it is going to be here at AGI. So what is this stuff? And again, I apologize to the experts here. Next slide. So simply, I just took this out of one of these textbooks here. That's a simple definition. So don't be intimidated like, oh, it's just merely the ability of a machine to basically achieve its objectives, right? At an increasing level, right? Um, and before it was almost like reactive machines, uh, responsive machines, but now it's getting to level of, of much more than that. And then there's types of AI. Uh, I ran an artificial specialized narrow intelligence. When I was in the Navy, I was the combat systems officer. And this is where I got interested in technology because um, one of our advanced ships shot down an Iranian airliner and killed 300 humans. And when we read all the after action reports, and our ship was the one that had to relieve that ship. So I was there when I saw all these depressed, the captain almost committed suicide. And I'm like, how in God's name did the top cruiser, the Vincennes, make an error when they had the best systems? And my classmate Mountford was there and he goes, we lost control of this thing. We didn't understand it. It was getting too complex. And it was a fully automated, low-level AI. You turned it on, and it did everything. But the officer in charge had a key to deactivate it. Um, as they dug into it, actually, if they would have just let the machine do it, it probably wouldn't have shot it down. But they mixed the machine automation and then their intervention, and they got confused. Um, it was in the Middle East. Boats were attacking them. The ship was taking evasive maneuvers. People kind of panicked. So the weird type of thing is if they would have just let the machine do its thing, it would have identified that the, the airliner was turning away. But the human latency and the human machine interfaces, if you work on that, was flawed enough that they couldn't see the beginning turn of the plane fast enough. I later served on an advanced plane. They rebuilt that all in. So you would immediately would see the plane showing a changing maneuver. But it was over-complexifying, and, and it was a narrow sense. But it was my first experience, like, wow, this is really moving along. And just two weeks ago, this Deputy Secretary of Defense has rolled out the replicator strategy. They're going all in on AI and robots, which will mean a lot of money at Grand Forks, probably Grand Sky. They are now in the full arms race with the Chinese to roboticize the military, um, which is a cyber guy causing a little bit of concern. But fortunately, NDSU, you and NDSU, Minot, and Bismarck are all certified now. Um, and, and Steve Shirley tells me the cyber program is growing like crazy in Minot because the airmen are being told you need to get some certificates and here's Minot is offering this. So, so we're well positioned in North Dakota. But when I got here, we had none of this. And I want to thank NDSU. They were the first ones to, to, to reach the barrier. We had to try five times in Annapolis to get that certification. So it was not easy. Next slide. So what has happened in AI itself? And this is a very, very, this is boiling down a couple of these books to like one slide. Um, good old fashioned AI was the stuff you remember way back, you know, programming, basing a building on if then statements and then some networks. They're the first checkers game, I think, was the 1950s, you know. Um, but people thought it was going to be basically brilliant software engineers, except a guy named Ray Kurzweil said, you know, I think the breakthrough will come on compute. And Brockman mentioned him yesterday. Kurzweil just said, you know, just brute force computing 
could be the breakthrough. And, uh, and that's essentially what compute means is how many machines. Um, I was just talking to uh, the president Williston yesterday. I have weekly calls with presidents and he's dealing with some other issue, but he said, you know, the, the crypto center is so massive outside Williston. They're going to have to probably zone this because the noise from those machines is equivalent of low level urban city. And they never told the neighborhoods that's what it'd be like. There's that many machines already running crypto algorithms. So now there's an absolute race on compute. That's what that is. That's all the machines. That's NVIDIA, whatnot. Then the data, we all gave the data, right? Okay. So we put all the data, all the photos, we tagged all that. So we gave all the learning data, which didn't exist before, right? Okay. So now it had something to learn from. And then they had crucial software, um, convoluted um, analysis, some call it that, but basically the more common thing is called deep learning or neural networks. So adding that software with all that data, with all these machines starts to get stuff that looks like intelligence. And at some point I may frame in my office that when I was in Britain in my last job, um, sorry, it was in Estonia, they had a big cyber conference there and someone rolled out um, some stuff from Jeffrey Hinton who showed some chat models that were really effective. So I wrote an email back to both the computer science department and the cyber science, like, hey, I'm in this meeting. They talk about Jeffrey Hinton may have had a breakthrough in chat, GP, chat, and this could be the beginning of AI. And a computer scientist, any Stanford grads here? Stanford computer science grad slapped me down publicly with Admiral Miller, North Dakota guy. His brother used to announce the call. Thank you, Dr. Hagerod. I know you're a cyber professor, but I work in the field of AI. And I know of no one serious in AI who even messes with chatbots. <laughs> so, I mean, this, they didn't even see this coming. Um, but what it was, was all the language we put in, right, was what it allowed it to learn. So we now have these large language models with literally all this stuff. And as we'll touch on, it's becoming really contentious. The most important Supreme Court battle in the world may about to emerge on that issue of whose data that is. So then what comes out is a generative pre-trained transformer. It's a long word for a learning deep neural network that learns on this next slide. Um, and so chat GP3, people generally think it's pretty close to the Turing test. The Turing test means that you really can't tell if a human is writing to you or not, okay? Mm -hmm. But I put this down here because chat GPT4 came out and about 12 Microsoft engineers signed this research paper. And you wonder why 12? A Google engineer about two years ago said the same thing. I think I'm seeing the signs of AGI and he was fired. Yep. It was so explosive for him to make such a claim. They fired this engineer because this is the big event that changes the world. Okay. So there's about 12 people all agree. Like, no, we all agree. And I bet you like, you got to sign, you got to sign, you got to sign. I'm not signing this paper. Just came out a few months ago. So the other thing's happening. Anybody seen the movie? Um, uh, Oppenheimer, movie about the bomb, okay? Uh, most historians of technology agree that if it wasn't for the Nazi threat, the nuclear bomb would never have been invented. You couldn't have got enough Congresses or Politburos to spend the equivalent of $100 billion on one research project, right? I mean, our, our VPR would be like, we're going to give you $100 billion. It Nothing. never would have happened, right? You would have been voted out of Congress. But they said the Nazis are working on this, and Einstein signed a letter. This is the equivalent of what's just happened. There was Britain shut down its AI research a couple of decades ago. Okay. There was an AI winter, but with this breakthrough now, there is so much talent and money going to this that it is, I was going to say it was going to happen. Now I can say Brockman says it will happen. He said it yesterday. We're not sure exactly when, but he implied within probably the next 10 years, this breakthrough to AGI, which means it can do anything a human can do and better. All right. So next slide. So. While that's happening, other major things are now happening. They roll out the metaverse. The White House says we need a bill of rights for humans. How do you frame that? Okay, it's not just a programming thing, right? Okay, I mean, how do you how do you engage AI and then things like this? Next slide. Then how do you, you know, and I'll give Jake credit for this because he goes, this guy's a robot guy. So after you talked to me two years ago saying he's a robot guy, I put him in here because sure enough, about a month after Jake mentioned that, he rolled out his home robot. Musk's goal is all your cars are his and all your home robots are his. 
<laughs> Basically, he will be the guy that provides you with the thing that, as I'll show you, works in human three-dimensional space. He's leaving the metaverse to Zuckerberg and all the rest. Just for clarity on <clears throat> Tesla's role there, they believe the humans are not as good at building things as robots will be. And they started that in the factories already today without a walking humanoid. It's just our, just the arms of the robots. But the, the robot is that he's building there is one that will be, they're describing as the AGI robot. So it's going to be able to take artificial general intelligence and do things that humans do all the time. Go pick up and sort the room, clean the basement, put a car together, whatever. That's so, what they're building. Yeah, so I'm going to try to give you a framework because I know all of us are trained to be specialists and and I was encouraged by a guy named James Martin, who is now dead, but he wrote the first computer science textbooks, uh, Oxford grad. And he became the biggest donor to Oxford, and I, I'd gone to Oxford. And he refused to give it to any specialized school, not even computer science department. He created a center for interdisciplinary studies going, the specialists need to come together. And if I get a chance, I'll mention what I read that he wrote to a small group of Oxford grads, which got me even more motivated on this. But anyway, next slide. So this is how to frame this. This is the world, and I know you saw this in May, but we have this world of humans and nature it's still going to exist, especially if you don't chip yourself. We're going to have increasing expansion of machines and robotics, cyberspace, metaverse, uh, and then the integration of these things. This is a way to frame investments, building companies. You know, Jake's doing incredible work to help farmers move from basically what they were in is basically humans getting in a wheat truck and driving along a dusty road. He brought them into cyberspace, connecting to markets, trading. If they had an advantage to trade right now, they could do it while they're driving their truck, right? Before they had to go deposit the grain elevator check and put in their bank account and buy futures. He's now trading a huge percentage of the grain in America, a North Dakota company that somehow got the word bushel. I still don't know how he got that. Copyright. <laughs> it, I know. How did Google not buy that thing? You see, this is what I'm getting. That's what I told the students. So Kamali uh, can't spell agriculture. That's right, exactly. This is where we create wealth is teaming what we do with AI. We'll get that later. Okay, so next slide. Um, so <clears throat> these are the tasks we have to do. And higher ed is right center of all this. We have to create competitively these technologies. We cannot not opt out of that. Provost, join us. There's a seat right here for you. We kept it for you, a seat of honor. Okay, well, if you want to, you've got to probably do things. Thank you, Dr. Lee. <clears throat> we have examples in history. China stopped sending ships to sea, stopped expanding. They did not invent a steam engine. Britain did. Britain, a country of a few million people, dominated and took control of China because they had steam engines. Read about the opiate wars. They steamed all the way up the Yangtze River, and they dominated because they didn't embrace technology. We have no choice. We have to create this stuff. We'll be a museum society, and we will not be running our country. And our state will be a dusty what the Hopper family called Buffalo Commons. Okay, and I want to thank Dr. Fitzgerald, Pringle, you, because we don't want that, okay? Um, but we have to control the technology. I'm a cyber guy, but even Russell puts it in his title. You don't want to lose all your IP. You don't want to get hacked, right? So we have to control this stuff. This is the whole cyber field that's emerging. But we have to civilize it for people from humanities and all the rest. What are the policy, law, ethics? What are the rights? You know, I mean, can algorithm own land this is going to come to the state legislature i guarantee you someone's going to create an algorithm they're going to give it citizenship saudi arabia already gave citizenship to a robot called sophia it was a stunt they have no big industry but they want to be there. they've given citizenship to a robot what if they link that robot with ai and she it wants to buy land in north dakota i can see our legislators now ah ah i'm going to offer 100 million dollars to the walker family I'm going to sell. You can't. A robot can't own land. Okay. So law schools are. And then for all the, the teachers here, regenerating our students and the knowledge, because none of us are getting out of this life alive. Um, you know, at least our life extension isn't there yet. But, you know, we've got to bring the next generation along to, to engage this. And that's why I want to thank Mr. Biller for all the time you spent on the higher ed board. I mean, someone is, is doing profound work and they don't have to, you know, I get paid to do it. Um, and, um, and so this is back to reference the momentum, because if we don't get it right right now, we will lock in for future generations, uh, and they won't be able to break out of these, but if anybody thinks they can move the freeway now, I want to move I-94. It's done, right? Those decisions were made. And that's what the theories of technology talk about. Things lock in the QWERTY keyboard. Why is Microsoft wealthy? 
I heard Governor Bergen one time slip, you know, it was all about competition was you got to find a moat. <laughs> the moat was DOS became the computer software for IBM. Nobody could compete with DOS. That's what Bill Gates and his dad did brilliantly. They built a moat around their invention and then the money flowed. Um, you will be the moat for the future if you get it right. If we don't, it's just Katie bar the door. Next slide. Okay, so there is now taking the world with what I think the task we have is to um, control this, okay? Um, and so now to help you, wh what are some theories of technology that can help you engage this stuff? And then I'm gonna bring some history in to say how dramatic and unimaginable things can be in the past. We kind of smooth over history, no big deal, but it was truly cataclysmic when we began to move from human-centered world to a machine augmented world. So next slide. Real quick, um, yeah. Can you can we talk through that graph you invented here? This this. Yeah. Go ahead. What I would give some? I feel like it would be helpful to get some examples of. What, okay. Yeah. What these arenas look yeah. like. Yeah. So what this would be um, is this is, I would argue in China now, this and this is totally overlapping um, people's privacy. This is. Oh, get up front. This is 2017 when Re Senator Re Representative Kaiser was going to put a law in North Dakota that if you are in your car, you can be with the machine, but you cannot be monitored by the internet and voice listening software. He had a law teed up that a human who wanted to get into his car or her car could drive, and this could not listen in and suck the data away. I went down to the hearing. It was, you couldn't even get in the room. Peterbilt, Uber, Lyft, GM, Ford, Tesla were in North Dakota in that committee hearing. Davison passed a law that Apple App Store is anti-competitive. Oh my gosh, Apple flew a team of people in here, but fortunately, Klobuchar was listening and she got Apple to be less extorting. It'd be like, if you put something in Apple, they would take a bunch of the wealth of Bush. How much? 30%. Still today? Yep. Yeah, well, it's, even, it's moved now, but it was 30 It was outrageous. They would take a creator like him, extract his wealth, and then bring bushel of apple.com, right? You know, they would then, so, so that's an example, okay? Uh, other examples would be, basically, these are just machines, robotics, not connected to the internet. I can tell you, as a nuclear engineer, there is no connection, okay? Because of security, we don't want these viruses going into reactors. Um, the USS North Dakota, I went to the commissioning. You couldn't take a cell phone on that ship because they knew the Chinese could hack the cell phones and hack the software. Um, one of my most proud moments, I had a, a student um, named Mater, Tyson Mater's, and he goes, I think we can hack a ship. And uh, nobody in the Navy was listening. And uh, he, I was a director of the cyber, director of the cyber center. To do it. I'll sign the thing. Just like I was the first guy to sign the emerging program. You know that. I was the first administrator to sign the letter for Greg Tavan. That's my moment in history as you build this thing out. At least I signed the letter going, this is not a crazy idea. Um, he went to the lead admiral of the Navy. They gave him some money. It was a couple 25-year-olds and a professor from Johns Hopkins helped him. Uh, he was a military officer. So, hey, I want to come to the ship and just visit my, my friends here. So they, they kind of staged it and walked on. He put a flash drive into the computers. He took control of a multi-billion dollar ship. When they briefed the lead admiral in the Navy, I'm told by slide three, they classified his work top secret. Because they didn't see how this could, you know, go over. And all of a sudden, you know, the Chinese are getting into your ship over the web, right? You know, so that's some examples. And, and we'll derive this a little more, Okay. Um, and again, some areas are just going to blur. I mean, the, the incredible complex spot is cyberspace, machines, and humans all right in here. And I'm just saying we need to keep AI out of taking over. But we already have the conflict. Creating, Tesla's the one on the machine-human mm -hmm. problem with AI right now. And then you could argue open AI is the leading human yeah. cyber problem. Absolutely. And, and connecting. this thing, you would take this for different industries. Like Dr. Fitzgerald would take this for agriculture. Right. You know, like, OK, agriculture, um, the people dealing with military, like, let's take the military example of aviation, because right now they're very concerned about losing control of uh, not aviation, nuclear weapons. This is a big debate. Do we ever want nuclear weapons connected to the Internet in any way? 
Um, do you want to start a nuclear war because someone hacked your computer, right? So those are examples of where, hey, there's, there's a wall. We don't want that to happen. But, but this could apply to your, your raising your family, putting limits on your children, um, spending time on social media, right? Um, I had a friend at Annapolis. I said, your kids are using social media too much. I'm watching them. And he laughed. He goes, it'll all work out. Before I left there, he came in with his backpack with all his kids' cell phones. He goes, all their grades are going down. The math is boring to him. History is boring to him. And he goes, now they get their cell phone done when their homework's all done because they needed help with these boundaries, basically. And I want to give credit to the governor is Innovate uh, Conference. Anybody go to Innovate Conference for K-12? Yeah. I thought he was going to have another, um, hey, here's a new education app. His speaker, Nicholas Carlisle, was the devastation to young women's body image and confidence. And you'll see a slide of what's really going after him now. I give governor credit. I mean, he's a technologist going, but we have to think about human welfare. That was the keynote speaker was how to protect young women in particular. I think men are going to be vulnerable too. you know, about body image for men. That'll be next. Okay. So let's go through some of this to build the, so, so people have all sorts of theories, politics, religion, but there actually are theories of technology to help you to think about this. Next slide. Um, there is a theory where it's game over. Technology literally is a life force, and there's nothing we're going to be able to do about this. Okay, uh, I don't subscribe to that. I'll give you some examples using military examples of where people who are basically told defend the country and kill everybody, defend your country. So we need rules in armed conflict. I mean, if they'd even do it, and I think it's reasonable for us to say, yeah, we do put some limits on here, right? And I'll even mention a guy named Ronald Reagan about that. Um, the other theory I think is most appropriate is that we have agency to engage and shape what we're going to do with this stuff, but you need to speak up early because of actually number four, okay, the momentum theory. But what is driving all this is Norbert Wiener was right, Claude Shannon, incredible, truly visionaries. Everything that's alive in the world runs on a cybernetic cycle of sensing, thinking, acting. So think about machines basically taking that whole process. Um, and uh, so those are some theories that can help you, okay? Uh, and lots of books on them. Next thing. So um, that's the cybernetic cycle, you know, since think act, since think act, since think act. Um, are you able to get rid of the stop share screen thing? I just realized it's blocking out the thing up there. Let's take a look. See if you can. Um, if you can't get rid of it, I don't know. You just look up. It'll, 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 it'll float away. Hide right. floating. Hide. There. Go to more. Go to hide floating controls. Down, 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 down. Hide. Oh, hide. That was right there. There we go. Oh. Thank you. You can tell technologists, thank you. <laughs> All right, I'll move a little faster because I want I want people to be able to talk here. Uh, and we're scheduled for me to end, so I've got 20 minutes. Um, next slide. I gotta click it. Okay, so what's next now is some historical evidence for this framework. It just didn't come out of anywhere. And actually Ray Kurzweil, who was referenced by Brockman yesterday, uses history going, it's so complicated. Now let's look at patterns of history. He developed this whole theory of when things are gonna break through by basically, the rate of innovation, uh, and I think you do it with social adaptation as well. Then I'll, I'll explain to you that our world seems normal now, <clears throat> but it was unimaginable for the people at the time. It was called a paradigm shift. It was just truly cataclysmic to many people who were maladaptive. And I'll talk about two countries that were maladaptive, and we are dealing with them now. Uh, and I believe AI, AGI will cause a similar event that things will be unrecognizable. And this is where we live in presentism. We couldn't get up in the morning if we thought cataclysm was going to happen to our business tomorrow, right? We wouldn't be able to sleep at night, right? We'd all, so we are naturally to be um, comfortable. We go to sleep at night, but when you start adding years to it, we have to be, and I'll have a whole theory of resilience of how to approach this. And, and um, um, especially for the young students who, who are going to be here longer, uh, that's a strategy to approach this. Next slide. Okay. So this is how the world worked. Okay, uh, ancient tapestry, it was humans sensing, thinking, acting, muscle strength, um, and that dominated the world. Add animals, and the reality is that still exists. I was an Afghan veteran, and I'll tell you, when you tried to negotiate treaties, you didn't do it over the internet, and you didn't wear the dark glasses you see in the special forces. You took glasses off, because you know it's a very patriarchal, but they wanted to know, can I trust this person to protect my tribe and my daughters, quite frankly? And that's what they do, got right up there and talked to them. So there's lots of still, uh, this exists, right? You're at home by yourself with your family, no technology, you're playing Yahtzee or card games. Uh, you know, it's interesting. My grandchildren really love like physical board games now. It's very interesting. It's kind of a throwback or something. So this is how the world worked and still has elements. Next slide. 
So let's just depict that on the lower end where influential factors are mostly human in nature and then machine factors become more influential up as you go up, right? Okay, and I'm gonna use drive this militarily. And so now we begin to enter accelerating adaptation machines to basically acting, not thinking or even senses. Next slide. So these are the S-curves, classic S-curves. There's a book on innovation that's all about keeping the next S-curve. That's how companies keep going, the next S-curve. So a series of innovations, mainly physical, right? The catapult, the gully galley was invented, stored energy, the compass, uh, gunpowder, and this thing called the Armada happens. Warfare, next slide. In 1571, the Muslims were invading Europe and the world hinged on a battle called Lepanto and it was all human driven. The ships really just sailed up to each other and men fought it to the end. They talked about the, the, the water around Lepanto ran red with blood. And there were three prototype or six prototype ships they didn't know what to do with. They didn't have any Marines on it. They just had cannons and they kind of hovered out on the edge. Within 17 years, the English who were outnumbered by the Spanish, the Spanish were the superpower. This is the famous Queen Elizabeth thing. The Spanish sailed in with the Armada filled to the brim with tough Spanish soldiers, and the British made a complete strategic decision. This is about cannons and machines, and they embarked no infantry. And they just, you can see the painting. They, other than one ship getting a little close, they just blasted the Spanish. The world we have today would not be recognizable in Europe. The Spanish would have dominated Britain. Maybe the language would have changed, I don't know. But what was one country adapted to the teaming of machines, literally gunpowder engineers persuaded the queen to don't bring, and you can imagine how radical that was, don't take any Marines. We got to have room for a cannon, gunpowder, and shot. Next slide. So this continues, okay? Now, this is my main point to people who think were well, those 20 executives said, we got to get control of this. As early as 1868, none other than the czar said, you know what? This evolution of weapons is so damaging to humans, we want to ban exploding shells. The czar of Russia proposed this and Teddy Roosevelt. This law basically holds to today. It just to encourage you, like what seemed impossible, like, are you kidding? Just blow these guys up. No, we want these young men to be able to go back home and not maim all. Them. Think of all the people who survived a bullet wound, but they would never have survived if they wouldn't have passed this kind of convention. So warfare begins to accelerate. Next slide. Um, this becomes a machine gun, the tank. Uh, the engineers, unfortunately, did not have a seat at the table. A lot of the strategists were classically educated, not engineers. There were some engineers who said, this war is gonna be so catastrophic, you don't understand, don't start. But cavalrymen dominated much of the British army. Uh, the German army, they went to war in World War I, next slide. Um, and on the right became a tank, a machine, and this is Eddie Rickenbacker, the first ace, I forgot to get an image of a plane, but literally it was the last place of chivalry. The rest was just brute machine power, artillery, machine guns, tanks. And because they didn't anticipate the effects, this shattered the societies across Europe. And one theorist said, we've so messed this up, we're going to live with the implications 100 years. We are living with it today because communism came out of this misunderstanding of technology. Um, this is Putin. This is Xi Jinping. Neither one of those would have been communists except the catastrophic failure here to understand this. And also, if you want to go further, in Russia, the railroad engineers were not in the cabinet and Russia began to starve. They should have been in the cabinet to get the food to the people. I taught this section. Like here was this Russian engineer, but the princes and the princesses wouldn't let him in on the meetings. They strategized. He goes, the railroads must run to feed the people. And that's what Lenin was counting on, was the people would starve. Um, again, misunderstanding the technology as the emergence of this new world of tight integration of human machines. Next slide. So that becomes the integration of human machine. Next slide. Um, it keeps going. Um, now, the theorists, as early as 1907, sorry, if I said Roosevelt before, this is the one. He was in 1868, sorry. Um, Roosevelt was with this convention to say, within four years of the Wright brothers playing, they said, oh, we don't people dropping bombs on human beings, civilians. They tried to ban strategic bombing. Give them effort for trying. It didn't hold. And next slide. Um, we led to that strategic bombing we obliterated tokyo berlin hamburg kurt vonnegut wrote about the only reason he survived the firebombing of hamburg which killed seventy-eight thousand people 
uh, was he was in a meat locker as a prisoner down in the basement. Um, so they tried, but eventually it became this, I commanded one of these things. You could really sleep at night because it was a totally robotic self-defense thing. So it did lower the blood pressure of our sailors and officers know the robot was on duty. I mean, it was always watching. So it, it, it helps uh, protect our people. But fortunately, we haven't connected AI and automation to like nuclear weapons. You know, we're, we're holding that back. Next slide. So this continued. And then just again to encourage us, none other than Ronald Reagan uh, and our leaders in the 1980s stopped a thing called the neutron bomb. They were going to develop a bomb that wouldn't blow up any buildings. It would just destroy humans. And like, do we really want to do that? Right. And so they, they banned it. And Ronald Reagan was behind that. And he did the first major arms control. He said, this is unstable. So Ronald Reagan, a hardcore conservative said, we have to get control of these technologies because they had all sorts of advanced ideas for nuclear weapons spreading them through the fleet. I carried three hydrogen bombs on my ship. I always felt uncomfortable while we had all these bombs everywhere. I mean, seriously. I mean, it's just like all the controls, three hydrogen bombs, and eventually they took them all off the ships and kept them in Minot and other places. Next slide. So that's kind of how the world is. Humans, machines working together. Next slide. Um, and machines did incredibly virtuous things. Our southern states were built on slave labor. The Roman Empire was slave labor. With the emergence of machines, we could break that socio model. But better than that, Dennis Cooley gets credit. He's from New York. New York embraced mechanization and machines so much that they produced more military output than all the South together. New York alone could arm the Union Army, which eventually freed these people from bondage. So I want to have that good example, like, thank God we invented these machines. Otherwise, you'd still be doing this to people, right? I'm, I'm going to insert here, I am not that freaking old. <laughs> <laughs> I'm close. Okay. <laughs> no, I'm talking about your state. You know, oh, I mean, God. people I mean, they, people refer to New York as crazy liberal, but they literally powered the union. They sent, I think, more soldiers. I mean, New York did virtuous work, uh, home of much of the abolition movement. Next slide. Um, but now let's use the Hagrod example, and I know my boss saw these already. Um, this was the Hagrods when they settled. That's my grandfather. He was about the same size as my dad and me, but he was an enormous man because all the manual labor he did. Uh, I remember my grandmother talked about a guy named Buddy, uh, I forget the last name, who didn't have the rigor my grandpa had and farming broke his health. He, he, he had like an arthritic shoulder, so he lost the farm. My grandpa could just power through. I, I found a little uh, crib sheet he had. of He worked 10, 11 hours in like the 1930s um, two dollars to buy my aunt Alice some glasses. He was a workhorse. He picked rocks. Anybody knows about that in North Dakota, right? He picked rocks, and it was like, you know, Joe Free paid him that money to buy Alice, and my grandma wrote Alice's glasses. Okay, well, thank God we don't do that anymore. My dad would never made it. My dad's had more my bill. So Walter. Horses, rudiment machines. Next slide. Um, then came the steam engine. What you don't see is there's 24 workmen in the background, but my grandpa's a young steam engine attendant down there, the integration of human and machines, right? Next slide. Um, now, within from 1910 to 1938, all those guys were made unemployed, basically. My grandpa is now doing the harvest himself. So, in one generation, you went from horses mass labor to a Romney combine and a Ford truck. Now, actually, there's some kids in the background that help a little bit, but the point was he could do the harvest himself. So that was incredibly positive. Uh, people then went to the cities, um, but unfortunately, um, Russia and China used collectivization. They killed tens of millions of farmers who didn't want to become factory workers. So that was maladaptive. We had market forces and Roosevelt then invented social security, unemployment, right, to help people in the cities who would lose jobs. So we had a humane way to adapt to this. But the point was, it was absolutely uh, ground shaking. But then Brad Smith of Microsoft came here about four years ago and gave a speech about his, his book. Next slide. Um, as this emerged, humans and machines, the horses went away. Next slide. This is a famous graph of horses and mules in agriculture. Horses and mules are red, red on the right. For 15,000 years, the horse and mule population grew across the world because they did agricultural work. And if you can believe this, it peaked in 1910. So no wonder my grandfather was so like, what's happening to agriculture? We need more horses and mules. No, you don't. 
That was the point where we had a secular decline and horse and mules went from almost 30 million to 3 million and tractors, the Hagrods were one of the first, there's the first steam engines and agricultural applications around 1910. So then right on the left, 5 million. It looks all positive, profits, whatnot. What it did was it disrupted the economy. Anybody here grew up on a farm? I think Ryan, you didn't, okay. What kind of crops do horses and mules eat? <clears throat> hay, right, hay and oats, right? You don't need it now because you'd have 27 million horses. So what would you do with your land? Move it to what crop? It's all corn and soybeans now. Cash crops. The precipitating event of the Great Depression was a second, third order effect of mechanization. Brad Smith doubled down on this. They didn't see the second, third order effects that this then drove down agricultural prices. Banks began to collapse and the Federal Reserve should have been inflated as early as 1927, 28. They didn't, and the whole thing toppled, basically. And Brad Smith said, something like these curves will happen again. We don't know what they are, but second, third order effects of what on the face of it is a very positive thing, say backbreaking labor, but he shouldn't have lost his farm, but you take it to second, third order effects, what are those? Next slide. So this happened in our social structures. That's the Hagerot Butte in the distance. The, that was the little schoolhouse my grandpa went to. My dad was there two years, then they moved to town. The little hamlet basically depopulated, right? And we know this now across North Dakota, these depopulating villages that were the foundation for 15,000 years. Little agricultural hamlets and villages were how we built. Jefferson talked about it. As late as 1806, Thomas Jefferson, like, we'll have the Rome, yeoman farmer in villages. Within 50 years, they begin to come under pressure in the East and eventually here. So I would say, if you saw the news, Philadelphia was rampaging last night. These cities were brought together to bring mass labor, capital, energy, transportation. If we don't need to bring all those people together, what is the social structure in these mega cities? Will that be pictures we see in much of suburbia around our mega cities? That's that is so shocking for my grandfather. My great grandfather founded Center North Dakota. The coal plant saved that, but he had. We see some of his writings. He was so positive about the future of center north dakota well the structure was obsolete right so thinking of what would happen to suburbia what is its purpose um so next slide um so that was just one emergence okay humans to machines one next slide um and the students actually knew what happened in october 69 that was the creation of the internet right um Nobody anticipated the internet until 1984, basically, uh, a guy, or cyberspace, sorry, it was a neuromancer book. So now we have this second thing happening. Next slide. That's 1980. You could have, uh, Dr. Fitzgerald could ask her graduate students to draw the internet in 1980. That'd been a reasonable test question. There's the internet in 2003 on the right. Um, I just show the undersea cables because of the Navy now. That is the most classified work in the world. You have an entire Navy now patrolling and trying to protect those cables. If those cables are severed, the world economy begins to collapse. So support Navy budgets, <laughs> okay? I mean, no offense, my son's an army officer, but unless we get some quagmire, the army is not gonna finish off the world. But if if someone blows up some of those cables, I mean, I stand by. So anyway, add now AI to this, next slide. So this is actual data represented, but the internet has surged after COVID, right? All the online education research. So, so it's growing rapidly, this space of internet activity. Next slide. Um, so now this is the world we have. And this is where you guys are occupying this, right? Still humans, their cattle, horse husbandry. Sorry, I'm blocking my pause here. Um, the machines all interlock being in different ways, right? To create wealth, possibilities, opportunities. Next slide. So how do we then situate AI? We've already got ahead of this a little bit. Next slide. I would submit we have to find a humane, um, positive way, but also allow entrepreneurs to have confidence that when Jake raises capital, because you've talked to Barry Batchelor before, right? Barry Batchelor, visionary. I was early on the cyber thing when I got here. People joked about me. They said, you'll get cybered by the chancellor because I'd seen the top secret classified briefings of the Navy being devastated by a single flash drive. One flash drive it was called Buckshot Yankee. The Russians and Chinese scattered some flash drives around about 10 U.S. bases. And sure enough, one sailor or officer picked up a flash drive, put it in the computer. The entire Navy's networks came to a stop. 
United States Navy. Because of that, they created an entire fleet, the cyber fleet called the 10th Fleet. I told Barry the story because he'd heard I was kind of weird. <laughs> he told me later that when he sold his company, the number one holdup was, is your data cyber secure? Do you really have control of your IP? That's what he spent the most time on. So for entrepreneurs, and that's why those guys showed up in Washington, that we have to have rules, liability. And right now, OpenAI is being sued by Sarah Silverman, Elon Musk, New York Times, because they're saying, you scraped Twitter, you scraped all my data. I own the wealth of OpenAI. So the mother of all court cases is going to work their way forward on, on that. Where, how did you reach in and grab our stuff, right? Next slide. So what is my suggestion for us going forward? Uh, and this is something that I've, I've told my bosses that I shoot for day to day, as boring as it is, being reliable in what we do, that our networks work. I mean, just to know, we, we had another attempt at hacking one of our universities. And thankfully, the bot stopped it, but it was pounding at the gate, okay? Every night you're sleeping, thousands of these things are just doing this. Anybody see that one of the major casinos in Las Vegas has had to file a filing of the SEC? Material effects on their annual statements. They're shut down. They've papered pencil. They've hired all these temp workers. Was there a cyber guy or gal even in the C-suite, right? Oh, we don't need him, you know? So anyway, think of resilience at several different levels across this thing. Okay, next slide. So day-to-day -day reliability. So it's the ITs, reliability, adaptability, transformability. Day-to-day -day doing our job. And this is also just for our own stress management. So talk about all this stuff, just doing day-to-day, -day, taking care of your family, getting the kids to school, uh, keeping the networks up, running, that you got to do that, right? And as, and as Jake and others will tell you, many businesses built out of like 3M did some basic, you know, Minnesota mountain manufacturing stuff did it well, and that became the base on which they then could do other things. But they had to keep doing the, the traditional business as well for quite a while before they broke into something new. Uh, same with us. We got to keep teaching students where they are uh, before we might build a transformative metaverse, which we'll talk about briefly. Um, secondly, you need to be sure that the organization you have really, can you next slide? Um, preserves adaptability, that when people want to adapt and do things, you really welcome this. And this is where, um, you know, if I can share, he, he didn't have to vote on it, but I was really pushing digital literacy as a system-wide. And some of the campuses got to some board members and basically they watered it down to delay it longer. It was absolutely urgent. We began to adapt, lost the vote. Uh, I've written my goals accordingly that each campus will kind of proceed at its speed. And I'm, I'm kind of lobbying him that he's leading this AI group and say, hey, we've got to go faster. And we want to set a goal, but you campuses get together and tell us what can you do faster. But that's a barrier to adaptation, right? It's like, no, we don't need to do that. The governor and, and representative four passed the cyber K-20. Every high school kid has to take a computer science class. And we're going to wait another year? Anyway, that's an example of barrier innovation. But we had here as an example that we bought a cloud instance of Blackboard. So when the shock of COVID came, the classrooms emptied out. We didn't go broke paying for all the new bandwidth. We already had it priced in our contract. And those are all the graphs going from, you can see that minimal down to massive, you know, bandwidth going through. Next slide. And then transformability, you know, just being adaptable and reliable will not do, lead to this. Uh, and the best quote I got, it's attributed to um, Einstein. I don't think it was him, but whatever. It is continuous improvement of the candle did not lead to the light bulb. There had to be a break, literally a break, right? Hey, just keep improving the candle. No, there has to be a way of different thinking. And I'm convinced some of these are going to happen. And we have to honor those people who do that and not shout them down or blog about them. Uh, we need those people to be welcome here, including outsiders that aren't from here, right? You know, that's one of the things like, well, where were you born? Where do you go to high school? The, we need to welcome some of those people. Next slide. So that's kind of the framework. Next slide. So. Um, what are some examples um, of how we navigate this? Um, I believe that the U.S. government, states, business leaders have to come together uh, and shape this, much like, you know, the 20 that showed up in D.C. And to our, our legislators' credit, they have formed an AI study group. So I would encourage the entrepreneurs here, maybe Jake, we can even connect you with Representative Bosch and Davidson to come talk to them. Because we want to also create wealth and not be China or, for that matter, West Virginia that remained an extraction economy during industrialization. 
Uh, but how do we improve this? Um, then we need to harden um, AI and our machines from hacking. Um, one of the students asked that question. What about hacking? You can poison AI. You can hack it. Okay. Um, it's been proven. Uh, and then lastly, we need to promote basically human vitality, security. Um, that's one of our prime responsibilities. Next slide. So some examples. Um, several people talk about the wealth creation is staggering. One quadrillion, a thousand trillion will be created. And a guy named Schumpeter would say creative destruction. A lot of companies are going to go broke if they don't adapt. So I'm encouraging you to adapt. <laughs> Keep going. Um, and we got to do that. Otherwise, we will be the West Virginia, um, whatever. Uh, we need to diversify our economy, especially if they outlaw oil at some point. Uh, but we need to do it in a humane way. Uh, and these are the 20 people. I mean, you can't believe they're all together. Here's the CEO of Microsoft. There's Bill Gates. There's Musk. Zuckerberg's over here. They joke because they've been challenging each other to do Taekwondo against each other. And they all agreed we need the government to help provide some guidelines so we don't lose public confidence in what's happening. Uh, next, And then there's actually been a proposal out of the White House for that. Next slide. Uh, cybersecurity, absolutely crucial. And for the students and the faculty here, we've got to public trust these facilities, but literally your student data we collect on them could haunt them the rest of their life if we don't secure and protect their data. It's one thing if someone hacks me in a couple of years, I'm 62, but you're trying to start a company and they know everything about you and where they've been, um, that we really have this, this, and then talk about cyberbullying, what the governor talked about, Nicholas Carlisle, the, the, the attacks on women and their body shape. You know, we have, a, we have a profound responsibility of how to do this. And that'll be, maybe not your group, but Warford's group. We're talking about the metaverse versus structure, how we protect people. Next slide. Um, third, I'd say uh, the human security is absolutely crucial. So how many have seen this girl on the left? And if you know the answer, don't give it away. What's your name again? Sophie. Sophie, don't give away what's it. How many have seen this girl? This girl? Okay. She has a million and a half followers. She is making a lot of money. She's a robot. Or an avatar. She's not even real. Her body shape is almost inhuman, I think. And I've got three granddaughters. <laughs> They're gonna have to compete with that. And already my son-in-laws and daughter-in-laws used to thought I was nuts. Like, dad, tell us more about this stuff. Okay. Tell us a little more about what you're thinking. Okay. And the governor, to his credit, had Nicholas Carlisle, who that is his quest to protect young people from the effects on their mind of this. So now what if the Saudis buy her, I think she's Malika is her name, and she gets linked with citizenship with Sophie. And now she buys land and she amasses a hundred million followers. I mean... <laughs> If you're not excited to law school, you know, I'm gonna to try to go to UND and give a talk. And I wanna thank NDSU that you was invited me. But see what I'm saying? Just profound issues of having you on the advisory board to law school. In fact, I know it's being taped, be careful. I was on a board of one of our boards on education. There was not a single technologist in IT on the board yesterday. And I'm like, how is that possible? He was sitting over running the computer. I said, you need to come over and sit down and, and help advise us, all right? But anyway, the painting on the right is a guy named Thoma wrote that, made that painting when industrialization was happening and a lot of people were getting depressed as they moved from their villages. Uh, and a guy named Durkheim, a leading sociologist, coined the word anime. You can Google it. It's just loneliness. It's detachment. Many of the organizations we have that look like, oh, the YMCA, the Elks Club, the Moose Lodge, these came out to help former farmers feel connected to something when they came to the cities. We're going to need virtuous things like that. If you're an entrepreneur, um, Think about that. Think about human adaptive things to help people feel good, be positive, uh, huge space, I think. Uh, you might even make money. Next slide. Um, I put this in here for the students. My wife and I give a talk to churches. Bank of North Dakota had to do it um, for their workforce. These are actual systems that your brain runs. And iPhone use, bullying are affecting um, pleasure and tranquility. The memory system is being affected learning system. Um, I had a whole bunch of backup slides for the students. I, I, I won't bore you with them, but, but the data is now pouring forth on it's affecting the, the misuse of the technology is affecting several of these. The positive use was incredible, like, you know, language, math ability, Khan Academy, et cetera. But, but these systems all are being affected in ways we're just getting our hands around. Um, and that's her background. Next slide. So human policies will be absolutely crucial. Um, 
again, Stuart Russell, knighted by the Queen. His last, his last concluding pages, if you can believe this, he's got all this stuff. He's got annexes on, you know, neural networks and all the rest. But his last statement in the book, basically, is, I'll read it to you. There is no technical solution to this problem. The solution will seem to be cultural. We will need a cultural movement to reshape our ideals and preferences toward human autonomy, agency, ability, away from self-indulgence and dependency. If you like, we need a modern cultural version of ancient Sparta's military ethos. He's not a military guy. Um, and in one of his recent talks, he said, the movie you need to watch is Wally. He says, it's not going to be a Terminator scenario. That's not going to happen. It's going to be humans just becoming, you know, maladapted, you know, um, sedentary. The, the movies, you know, anybody seen the movie Wally? Anybody seen it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, that's the real challenge. Um, you know, going in the game world, but I want to give credit to the NDUS system. We have gaming now, but they include going for runs, going to the gym. They're incorporating that. Hey, you're not just going to sit on the game all the time. You're now also going to hit the gym together, right? That's an example of a positive adaptation. Um, next slide. Um, and to encourage the young people, in the end, the young people are the ones who lead these things. Um, that's DeForest who invented uh, the first digital on-off gate, uh, which was um, a light bulb. He just added another um, filament to make it uh, on-off, right? He, he, he he watched what Edison did and goes, let's add this thing. And um, that's DeForest. Then uh, Grace Hopper is there with these young students. Uh, she literally built the first human machine language. Now she's older there, but she started as a young woman. I, I, I want to have the students there with her, but the Naval Academy finally said it's a male dominated place, the computer science building. Named after her, the only woman who has a name on a building in the Naval Academy. It's like all men, she's got the name on there. Uh, and I helped with that whole battle over getting her name on there. Um, and then Bill Gates was, gosh, she like 17, right? You know, and then I could have put a whole bunch of people, right? You know, jobs. So we, we need to get these young people into your companies, into your, you know, have them at the board. And I'm glad you're sitting at the head of the table because you're in charge. Um, and actually, I think that's it. Um, so anyway, just to kind of wrap up, that's our challenge ahead. Create the technology, uh, control it. Um, civilized, everyone's got a job here. Teachers are absolutely crucial. Um, and that's kind of the world that I would offer to you that we're navigating. And again, you take that and apply it to your industry, you'd apply it to the military, like, okay. And, and so to build on a little bit, this is where the Geneva Convention needs to be updated. Um, nine years ago, I was invited to the Geneva Convention on how to control lethal autonomous machines. And I said, do arms control now, otherwise it's gonna get too late. Uh, you can actually, Google it. You can still see my brief there. Um, and I think we lost 100 ambassadors were there. And it descended into a shouting match actually between Pakistan and India about, you know, if you unleash the robots and the cyber attacks on us, we will shoot our missiles first. I mean, we've, I hate to say it, we've lost that window. It's going to be a terrible outcome for soldiers for a long time until it gets so bad, you know, we pass some new laws. But but hey, that's the military's problem, not ours. So you'd situate different industries here, you know, like food service, you know, I know my boss here um, was in that industry, you know, how much do we allow robots to go into that, right? Um, one of the things would be human impersonation. When I was at Geneva Convention, I said, you have to outlaw human impersonation, otherwise the economy will collapse. You can find a video of the CEO of Google about six years ago, rolling out an office assistant that cynically, deceives a woman in a hairdresser to get an appointment. I don't know if anybody's seen that. It's like, hi, uh, this is Vanessa. I worked for, for Susan. We need to get a hair appointment for her. Can you help me? And this, I don't know. Oh, well, no, I'm filled up. Well, can't you help? I mean, I really got to, she needs this point. Okay, I'll squeeze you on Friday. Oh, thanks so much. He gets a standing ovation for befuddling this, this hairdresser with fake empathy. I think that picture of Michaela should have, this is a bot. It should be right across the face. How many young girls won't even know that's a bot until they dig into it, right? That's human impersonation. And so I would think, any nurses here are doctors, right? Anybody have parents in a nursing home? 
Okay. My parents are almost 90, they aren't. But if they go to a nursing home, there'll be such pressures, for example, let's say on this thing here, to have robots move way in to the nursing home and maybe you just have a robot give false empathy to a dying person. But boy, it saved a lot of money. Do we want a society like that? Or do we say, you know what? Human nurses are prioritized and Sanford is gonna to have to pay them a living wage. But hold it, we can save we will subsidize. And the last thing I'll get off the stage is none other than Bill Gates said, we may have to tax the robots and algorithms to help make a better life people. I mean, Bill Gates said that, meaning, okay, tax the robots, tax the algorithms, so we can pay nurses a living wage so they can give real empathy, right? Because a lot of the nurses are quitting. My daughter's a nurse. She quit. I mean, she doesn't pay for the, the daycare. But, but those are kind of choices. You could use medical... Restaurant business, military is this framework of where we navigate that. And I was certainly hoping the, the article I'm writing with Patrick for the Dago to Digital Review, that when it comes to nuclear weapons, you know, that is away from there. We've got people in the B-52 bombers and why not? We've got missileers and there's no connection to the internet. There's no AI. It's a ballistic missile. It gets to a certain altitude above Western North Dakota and it just drops. There's no maneuvering. And then get to arms control so you don't have to maneuver them, right? We get the Russians and the Chinese together going, we'll all agree that a human will push the button and AI's out of it. And if you want to get scared, Patrick, thank you for finding that picture. The Russians have now automated a submarine that can go 6,000 miles and its whole purpose running on AI is to steam up the Hudson River and obliterate our port cities because America is a coastal place. I have friends who are in North Dakota who's a four-star admiral. Like, did they really do that? <laughs> did they really turn over a hydrogen bomb to a robot that will sail pitch up for days? What if it gets hacked, hallucinated? Why didn't they build it to have three people in there that at least they could pull a switch? So, you know, again, beyond our scope here, unless, you know, you're teaching students at Grand Forks or Minot, um, but big, big questions are in play now. So anyway, well, that'll, I'll stop there. We still have uh, about 20 minutes for questions or comments, um, challenges, please. It's just a way to try to shape this, this world that's coming. I think it's going to create general, incredible wealth, longevity. Did I mention to you, I was in a conference with um, Chancellor of New York, North Carolina, Ohio State, and some have medical schools. And um, the students should plan to live to be 102. The longevity will be incredible. You'll have nanobots monitoring. Widowmaker heart attacks will be gone. Uh, so incredible. Feeding the world, guys like Jake, Grand Farm, we should be able to solve the food problem. Um, Brockman said yesterday, remember, he didn't say universal basic income, like we got to give a subsistence. He said universal high income. There's going to be so much wealth created. So I want to be sure on the positive side, we want to compete in these companies, build these industries but we have to think of how we protect your IP, uh, protect the actors and creative people's, you know, information, um, and then make North Dakota uh, maybe one of the better places that balances that out. So anyway, I'll stop there. Um, Great, thank you. Are there any questions? You look familiar. Yeah, who, who are you? Yeah. I, oh, okay. I th yeah, I met you before. Okay. I just want to make sure because I'm like, okay, with Zoom, I, I can't remember. So thank you, Dr. Zion, for coming. Yeah. Go ahead. You had a question? Or, or oh, sorry. Oh, okay. I was curious. I, I, I came in late, so maybe I mentioned the topic, but I'm curious. This is now a, a pretty hot topic. Mm -hmm. Circles. Mm -hmm. like what I'm most interested in. in regulate AI mm -hmm. regulation. That's, I think where the politicians and governments have kind of are catching up with mm -hmm. AI. Mm -hmm. And regulation is, is a tough thing to do. Um, I know that um, there's there's some, some of the international governing actors are ahead of the United States government mm -hmm. in regulating AI. Right. For instance, the European Union, although not completely there yet, they came up with the AI Act which is still in the work of the European Parliament and maybe through, which sets out some 
protections for uh, you know ethical uses of AI and mm -hmm. protection of, of human uh, uh, dignity and human uh, access to technology and uh, ensuring social justice and uh, protecting mm -hmm. use of AI or and, and preventing abuses of AI and mm -hmm. uh, over you know the protection of, of data. Mm -hmm. China uh, just in August came up with a law that's in effect right now. It's mostly uh, tied to uh, targeted to research and universities to protect research from the abuse of AI. In the US, there's no such effort yet. Given the political, the fragmented political landscape that we have mm -hmm. in the country, where do you see that going? Well, it's coming. I want to thank Dr. Fitzgerald. She's if you if you don't think she's a big deal, she's a big deal. Can I say that, Dr. Fitzgerald? She's doing incredible work getting these grants, and a lot of this is built around advanced technology. Uh, but UND, we're looking at a you know again, we're trying to get to scale. It's one of my bosses here, um, partnering with people and whatnot. UND issues leading on several things, but um, the NSF has just come out with a big initiative on AI research centers. I think they want to establish five in the United States to tackle a bunch of issues, not just making new products, but but potentially this. So we're working right now, um, I think out of our Northern Plains, Mountains Innovation Alliance, I think six universities want to join us. So we're doing stuff we've never done before. I mean, truly, South Dakota, North Dakota, Montana, Wyoming, Idaho, like, yes, let's get together to compete for one of these grants, okay? Um, I know Carnegie Mellon got a big grant on AI ethics and stuff. We want to get some of that in the Midwest, right? So it's not just, the East Coast telling us what we should think about these machines. So it's it's moving. Um, I think part of the problem is is um, our Congress is so divided. You know, I mean, they're about to shut the government down. I, I mean, I just when I think about it, like there's such massive issues we should be dealing with. And you can't pass a budget. So I think we would be doing more. Uh, and I just want to let you know, North Dakota could have a voice here. You missed the fact that we had a hearing that could have actually protected every american's privacy in an automobile and the lobbyists crushed it six years ago but north dakota had the first another than heidi heitkamp with the supreme court to say it is unfair that amazon doesn't pay taxes and bushel does okay and they laughed her out of the supreme court in 1996 then south dakota came back south dakota versus wayfair and changed the united states so now internet companies so Little old North Dakota, we get together with our law schools, our political science departments, and we got two senators who are very engaged and a congressman. Armstrong is developing a real reputation on digital issues, by the way. Um, we could have a voice, and especially with our five states, that's part of our ambition. We've got 10 U.S. senators. Hey, let's all get together going, this is how you protect this. Here's a North Dakota idea, because I can tell you this, I'm seeing nothing out of any place right now. It, it's They're just flailing. And even... Uh, Ted Cruz said that nobody knows what they're doing. Um, and I've got a friend who's connected with the um, country music scene. And he said, he's having country music people come to him. You don't see on here, but the writer strike saying, you have to protect us. He said, I, I, I just, I didn't know, I couldn't even engage this here. They're coming through my door going, you got to do something to protect us. They're going to take all of our stuff. So he called me He goes, I know you've been kind of weird on this stuff. <laughs> I said, they're not wrong. This is about six months ago. And now of course the writer's strike, but go ahead. Next question. Is there, can you give us some hopeful examples of technology regulation when it's worked? Cause I don't personally have never seen it work. Um, and I, I think that in some respects, the European union hurts themselves in their two early, yeah, and then yeah. they make no progress. And that's why their economy is a disaster. Yeah. Course. Yeah. Well, I, I, you know, the ones I can tell you this is nuclear weapons, yeah, right? Sure. Um, so um, highly regulated. We well, have up until somebody like Putin doesn't care anymore. Right. 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 And Brockman gave the example. Brockman, another the guy who co-founded the internet said, we need a version of the IAIA, whatever it's the International Atomic Energy Commission. So none other than Brockman himself said it. He said, we are now at the point where we need laws and regulations. In fact, he said in here, he goes, you know, being in North Dakota, where you kind of respect government, respect our government, he goes, I used to think the government had a role. And he said, um, he said, um, a year ago, if somebody in our meetings would say we need the government to help, quote, you'd be laughed out of the room, sure. unquote. <laughs> he goes, now all of us are like, we need some ground. So here's a good example. OK, I was a historian of technology and I taught a course about automobiles. Um, 
if you can believe this, the car companies all fought the leaded gas standards yeah. and emissions until finally someone at GM said, you know what? If you change it instantaneously, like all of us have a new parameter, like here's our span of control, do anything you want. No, everybody now has to conform to this. We're okay. It doesn't convey a competitive advantage, but Michigan can't pass it against here. And the people building cars in Ohio don't have to do it. You have to do it all at once. And they went to Richard Nixon, who was not known as a liberal, and they passed it. And it all was okay, but it needs to be fair, right? So there's an example. The yeah. EPA, your kids are not going to have lead poison because we regulated that. Yeah. Cars have been power for five years, but yeah. Yeah, right, right. But the people, these aren't getting lead poison. Yeah, right? yeah. So, so no, there are cases... Uh, nuclear power is a great one, right? Strict standards. Uh, they got really strict after Three Mile Island. Other questions? Yeah. So, I mean, I, I have a similar thought in terms of like regulation. To me, a lot of times it seems like they're bringing in all these high tech guys in these meetings, but there's no like actual proposed regulation coming from that. It almost seems like even maybe Greg from open AI, maybe they're just saying, yeah, we think you need mm -hmm. to regulate it. We know you'll never figure out exactly yeah, what you yeah. do, so we'll just, you know, go along with mm -hmm. it. Performative. But yeah, it's yeah. what it seems like to me, because there's not, like, how do you regulate it? Because to me, it's like, well, with cars, you can regulate it because nobody's going to build a car manufacturing plant in the backyard. Mm -hmm. you got to have wealth, you got to have capital. But a guy in his basement can build a uh, new large language mm -hmm. model and train it with different data than anyone else with open tools in his basement and can't regulate that. Mm -hmm. right. the, the regulations that we typically have that seem to be sort of prospective. Yep. Anytime you, you see um, entrenched companies seemingly really enthusiastic about a regulation, it seems to be that it's been locking them up in some long oh, yeah. history of regulatory mm -hmm. capture. See, I think the same biases are at play with your, our nascent totally. AI companies. Same thing. Hey, we've got this locked down, and, and we don't want any. We don't want the next guy. So here, so here is practical um, example. Just, I'm giving you example. So I to prepare for this um, talk. Just you know, this is the work I did for you all. Okay, it was actually kind of depressing. I had to go plant a couple apple trees on my farm and went to a garage sale. Um, because there's a lot of doom and gloom, right? Um, I have confidence that America and North Dakota will do pretty well. I do think some of these big cities are going to have incredible challenges because they're, they're head in the sand. So they had a hearing on Capitol Hill uh, just a couple months ago with this question. Well, what do we do? Okay. So one person said, um, we need to go even faster, um, but we need a research moonshot on tech trustworthy. And I thought she was most compelling. She goes, the reason you can drive a Ferrari on a mountain road is you know you have brakes. What if you said, we're just gonna build fast cars, but no brakes. Who would feel comfortable driving fast? I thought that was a great example, right? You, you will drive a fast car on Kirby roads because you've got a good brake system to back you up when you want to. So, so have a moonshot on trustworthy technology that you can control. Um, and um, then um, said, require, um, risk assessments before large language models. And uh, you're not gonna hide them actually, they'll be massive. The number of computers will, will have to be massive uh, to, to do some you know, new stuff. Now, if you just access someone's database, then red team prior to deploying, uh, build on the NIST framework, uh, ISO SC42, okay? And then have reporting requirements that if you have a machine that has above 10 to the 26 operations is a reportable requirement, kind of like, do you have uranium, right? I mean, you can't have, depleted plutonium in your basement, okay? Um, you have to screen the customers that are coming to these companies, right? Okay, what, what is it you're gonna be doing? Um, and you have to then start to build security around these buildings, facilities, as if you'd put them around a reactor plant. I thought it was interesting. Um, another suggestion that came up, well, this was interesting. You find this interesting to business people. Uh, businessman, an IPO guy said, um, if you do not get involved now, Microsoft, Amazon, Facebook will dominate everything. The small entrepreneurs will not be able to get a foothold. There might have another company. We need a massive, the largest large language model available for anybody, which means like the Manhattan Project. Instead of letting, like DuPont built the plutonium bomb, but the United States government regulated it. I don't know if you knew that. DuPont built that. So that was, that was an IPO guy saying, I think he's already probably running into resistance from... Uh, 
from those companies. So that those are some some examples. But you're right; they were all kind of flailing. You know, they were all throwing things out there, and I'm not sure the congressman felt really helped by that. But those are some of the ideas I wrote down. This is a fine place to start. Like, you know. But G to your point earlier, GDPR. Do you guys know what GDPR is in Europe? So it's a it's a disaster of a privacy policy situation where they thought they were protecting everybody, and in reality, it prevents most any small business to be able to do anything on the internet in a really scalable way because you have to have enough money to build these robust security and technology reporting tools that you just can't afford to do when you're small. So like, for example, Bushel, we chose not to think about Europe because one of those is the main reason to build that capability would cost us millions of dollars just to start, right? And so GDPR is an example where if we go quickly to regulation here, the only people who can afford to overcome regulation is Microsoft yeah. and Google. Yeah, that's a good and point. I'm not saying that those, and we also shouldn't always assume that they're always bad. They're the reason why our government has a chance to compete against China. If those companies don't exist and companies like Palantir, then we don't have a chance because Nathan in his basement is not leveling with China right now, but Google can, and Google happens to work generally for us, right? And so- well, here's one. That's the thing. stuff that we have to figure out. This doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Right the CEO now. of Hugging Face, we believe that a leading AI company is called That's Hugging Face. <laughs> he said, don't go like the, the Europeans did, like ah, everything. He goes, yeah. narrow applications. You want to use a large language model to build a bioweapon? Mm -hmm. uh, no. Okay. We're going to regulate that. To build a weapon, a nuclear weapon? No. You want to build a large language model to help grow wheat and everything? Yeah. More wheat, the better, right? So he said, narrow what it is the application is, but don't limit overall research on the capability yes. of the computers. So uh, we do have uh, two questions in the chat before we uh, wrap up here. Okay. Uh, first one is, uh, how have several AI populated uh, with the emergence of chat G GPT? And are there any control measures with AI apps uh, with the use of NLP that can access the and access to several sensitive information. Um, read that one more time. Uh, with the emergence of Chat GP, Chat GPT, uh -huh. um, how did so many populate at the same time? And then, are there any control or regulations on these AI apps that they use NLP that can access to several information? Yeah, that's what we're basically talking about right, right. now. I don't think there's any any. That's why they were all in Washington D.C. It's it's happened so fast. I mean. If you believe Brockman said, would we release this the day before Thanksgiving? They thought they'd have about 500 people using it. Even they didn't know where this thing was going, right? So it's going so fast that, yeah, the answer is we don't have that yet. And then uh, with Lydia, Lydia is stating uh, she wants to know more about the human empathy that you mentioned. Uh, she's working on a bachelor's of fine arts. Uh, her capstone is about human experience and emotion through the perception of AI. And she's using uh, Dolly to generate uh, reference photos uh, to work through and paint, um, especially the impact of fake human empathy on youth during formative <laughs> years. Wow, tell her she's on a really good topic. Um, when I briefed at the Geneva Convention, uh, the picture I put up that got the biggest reaction was when Russia was last at democracy, there's a guy named Yeltsin who was a president, if you know that, a guy named Yeltsin. He stood up to the communists and he stood on a tank. People remember, it was a famous photo. Um, the soldiers were given the orders to kill him. They had empathy for Boris Yeltsin and they didn't kill him. Now, sadly, Putin got control, but, but the point was humans had empathy. Here's a, here's a kind of overweight man, <laughs> hair tousled, saying, We can build a better future. And the soldiers didn't shoot. So when I was in Geneva, I was sitting next to a guy who said, no, soldiers make mistakes. They do war crimes. We can automate higher ethics. I'm like, what are you talking about? I mean, it really <laughs> got in this fight. And this guy was sitting kind of between us, Paul Shari. Um, and I said, and you add hacking to this? I said, humans have stable social structures, okay? But the last thing you want is fake empathy or no empathy. Because that, in the end, is the only thing that really prevents, you know, really bad outcomes. So she's really onto something. But that was so upsetting 
when I saw the CEO of Google roll out and a standing ovation at his conference on this poor hairdresser who was bamboozled by a bot. You know, I mean, it was like. I think the thing on fake empathy is I take a different tact um, when even GPT-4, when it's acting in a courteous way, I mean, it's doing that because that's what it's been trained on. And it, everybody should be courteous to GPT-4, not just for, I, for one, welcome my robot over a little bit. It's because of what it does to us. I mean, if, if we have machines that are highly empathetic with us, it's a regulatory mechanism. We're all regulating each other's emotions here. Somebody is, suddenly acts nuts, we're going to actually work to, to help that person. Somebody needs to talk and they're not talking. We'll try to. I mean, we all do that, and, and we're going to have we're going to have robots and we're going to have chatbots that are going to be very empathetic. And the question is, does it take empathy? It's the aggregate of all of us being empathetic with each other in our discourse manifest in these learned language models. So, is that really fake empathy when it's acting like the best of us? And if it's doing that, is it going to bring the best of us out of it? So, I mean, I, I, I actually. I'm pessimistic about lots of stuff, or at least yeah. He gave a brilliant stuff. talk, and I want to thank NDSU had the first AI meeting way back in March. They were way early, and you gave a really good talk. There, there's a, there's a lots of stuff to be nervous about, but empathetic bots, I think, is an actually a good thing. And I, I think that's not bad. Go ahead, Doctor. I was going to say, I think you know, um, one of the things about some of the outputs of these technologies is that we think it's human because it's replicating what we maybe deceptively think is humanity, right? And so what does it really mean to be, to have humanity? And what are those, what are those outcomes that are not necessarily definable in the same kinds of ways, right? A, a large language model only has the things that people actually attested. Mm -hmm. There's lots of, as a linguist, I can tell you, there is an infinite amount of creativity in human language. You were leaning in. Well, I was just uh, wondering whether it was against the rules to do a pitch for my presentation to Victor now, which will actually have. <laughs> Not at all. We are uh, please. at our close. And then, please have the ahead. DDA yeah. sent it to all the campuses. This is where end issue is so important because these smaller campuses have lots of people want to learn this stuff, um, but they need. Yeah. That was Ann Denton talking for. <laughs> and... Hey, Patrick, did you have a question? Uh, well, it's not a question. Go ahead. I was just going to say, just in respect of time, it is uh, one thirty-two. So oh. does yeah, if you got to go, to go, please. My boss and I are going to lunch, so we have a few more minutes. Oh, okay. Yeah, I can stay a little longer because he and I are meeting, but then I've got a little gap, so I've got some more time. Go ahead. We have a context here, which I think we kind of take for granted, and that is the fact that we're talking about how difficult it is to solve the problem, how difficult it is to regulate, etc. But we can have a free discussion about it. And which is really needed as a society. And like Thanks for coming. Um, we have to work this out. But the capacity to have free discussion is under, is under attack, especially in Europe, Canada, um, and, and here. Um, so we might have a capacity, particularly in this part of the country, to actually have those discussions and figure things out. There's a lot of a lot of what people actually do comes out of discussion, comes out of social values, comes out of you know. Um, you know, just 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 the just the thinking about it, talking about it, such that a company or an actor or uh, a government will will not do something horrible because we've talked about it, because we've come to an agreement, without the necessity to have a law or a regulation, mm -hmm. which is always chasing after me. Well, here just to scare you more, Patrick, this New York Times article said all the car companies they were questioned on Capitol Hill. They said, "What is your relationship with law enforcement?" Do you have to get uh, a search warrant to hand over the conversation? Uh, no, it's just a handshake agreement. So these cars are listening to you, and basically they are willing to give your conversations to law enforcement. Okay. So a little bit different part of the aspect of the topic. Is there, <clears throat> is there like a national push on the cybersecurity front? From a so the way I see it is kind of at some point you're gonna have these bots that you say hack into Bushel's website and find vulnerabilities that I can exploit and give me mm -hmm. those like, vulnerabilities, and then I'll just go take down the website, right? Mm -hmm. Um, or take down their server or whatever. I feel like that's one of the biggest risks of AI right now, is like 
being able to have an army of 25,000 cybersecurity experts at your fingertips so you can tell them to go do something they figure out. Mm -hmm. To me, I feel like a lot of our national push really beyond how do we build a defensive AI that finds these vulnerabilities mm -hmm. and is pat building patches for them, yep. et cetera, so that we can keep up. Because I think at some point you're going to have this arms race of China says, hey, Absolutely. back into the U.S. Already, and take it down. To your, done. to your point, already the cyber companies' valuations are going like this. Look at Palo Alto's stock price, okay? They, they are going to have to go all in on AI to defeat AI. Um, and that's one of those things where, and even having the essay that Patrick had, there are areas where we will have no choice, where we have to deploy AI to fight AI, but hope someone has agency who vows to the constitution, right? And and um, I was just at this Navy board, um, like I mentioned, I mentioned that I was sitting next to Vince Cerf. Did I mention that, this group? I just talked to the students, but I sat next to the guy who actually wrote the TCP protocol and I wanted to take a photo. Oh, I didn't, okay, yeah. Um, and he he basically paused the question like, you know, are we are we really in control of this stuff? Meaning the military, like people who take an oath to the constitution because these huge companies have so much power, right? You know, and and you know, I never voted for Trump. I generally as a former military officer, I don't vote for a president. I just thought it was a bad, you know, thing to do, right? Um, but he was an elected president and he was deplatformed. He was deplatformed and couldn't speak to the American people, right? And so his question is, who is you know in control of these AIs that are going to have to tangle and that and and is it representatives of your political process or now the mega companies right I mean it's like like almost a, some of these movies you know so those are great questions but I can tell you cyber is a growing field we've we're 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 the I was invited to the White House last summer because of the great work NDSU Minot and Bismarck did we were the the most successful rural state in the country to get three of these certifications. And um, it is a full on press, I can tell you. And DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects is now issuing uh, like a call for research on trustworthy AI. They realize they've got to get ahead of this thing. Um, and uh, it's, it's it, you've identified the huge issue. Yeah, I think it would be helpful for the government to really, you know, I mean, I think there's some areas of regulation that might make sense, but you know, talking about funding, like working with Google and Microsoft, open AI, whatever, say, how do we build defensive AI bots yeah. that are going to defend our cyberspace? Because that's yeah, that's already happening. Top secret, top top secret stuff going on. I can tell you, um, you know, it's it's a massive race, and you just look at the valuations of the companies that are following that too. Yeah, feel free to leave. You got to get going. I just have my boss is giving me a little extra time, so. I want to go back to the discussion of how disruptive these technologies are to the human condition. And psychologists are now talking about uh, cognitive velocity. That is the speed at which these uh, systems respond to human interaction. Mm -hmm. That coupled with the transaction-based economy where it's all about fulfilling one transaction after another, cognitive velocity plus the transaction-based economy. That's a recipe for things to get completely out of control, even if humans have their hands on the button and the switch. It's especially when humans are interacting with the technology. If the cognitive velocity gets too much, there's a lag in the human interaction. And if they're just fulfilling transactions, I mean, that's a primary economic you motive. You just described the stock market. <laughs> yeah. that, is, that is exactly what's, what's happening. It yeah. has been happening for many years. AI, AI is running the decisions on yeah. stock market bias. Yeah, so, that, so even when we are in control mm -hmm. because of the conflation of yeah well here i brought a couple books um obviously um i mentioned him quite a bit uh stuart russell he's got several talks out of berkeley and whatnot even as a brit he's a berkeley um this guy military guy four battlegrounds basically the key things of power in the future will be compute data algorithms and then to our business human talent organization. How do you get your human talent organized behind this, right? Um, Eric Schmidt Kissinger, and this is the Dean of the MIT School. 
they got a billion dollar grant, a billion dollar gift from the Schwartzman family for AI, okay? That's why we got to get our five states together. You know, we don't want MIT shaping the world for us. But this guy is a guy named Yuval Harari. Uh, he wrote this six years ago, and he completely missed, in my opinion, the whole question of cybersecurity, right? But to your point, he, he thinks the people in Silicon Valley in New York, and he tries to be dispassionate about it, but he says they are creating, in chapter 11, a data religion. That in fact, they want what you just said. People are only going to be valued based on how much information they can process and how fast. People who are maladaptive will be kind of like in the brave new world. They'll go off to live in little reservations and, oh, we need to send them some, some food. But that is a new religion. Um, it will basically de-emphasize human beings uh, and only reward those who can process faster and faster, more effectively. Um, he says, I, I don't think it's going to be good. The economy may collapse, but he believes that's where it's going. Um, and I have seen some theorists want AI to write a Bible for us now. <laughs> so, so yeah, so I'm just saying you, what you're getting to is there actually has a whole chapter on that. And, and, and he doesn't say it's going to be good for lots of humans. Uh, but that's where, again, back to this, is that we can't stop this. This is reality. Uh, and in fact, um, already... South Dakota State is joining with Facebook. I think they got a $15 million grant to build a, a meta university. Um, Kansas State, I, you know, that's why I want our system to work together. This may come out of your group like, hey, call to action is we've got to get ready for this. So that's coming. I believe students will like to be able to have an Oculus on and walk onto NDSU, you know, see you walking by. Hey, good to see you, Tyler. I'm going to go to the coffee shop. Hey, I'm virtual but good to see in the coffee shop and if we don't have that i think in 10 years it will become a detriment but then they want to be able to take the dang thing off and go hey sir good to see you i saw your state board meeting you got that money for us you know they'll still want that we've got to be able to do those things but back to your point it has to be secure that they're not basically well here i'll say this i talked to this one congressman who called me and he's trying to come up to speed on this i said do you want your state defining the metaverse or do you want the values and norms out of California or Las Vegas and your daughter, he has a young daughter, will be in that metaverse? Man, that got him interested. I am convinced when, when Zuckerberg rolled out the metaverse, I actually was on a plane and I wrote about six pages. It will fail. There is no way you'll build a unified metaverse out of the values of any one place. It will be a federal system. I'm convinced that there'll be a North Dakota metaverse, South Dakota metaverse, and guess what? It will follow our century code. <laughs> It'll follow our rules on gambling and pornography. But if you live in Las Vegas, where a bunch of the stuff is legal, then they'll have the Nevada metaverse. And you can cross a border and go in there, but there is no way they'll be able to pull off a metaverse for North Dakota, Las Vegas, and Saudi Arabia. Are you kidding me? I mean, just what I'm saying it's just it's delusional that it will eventually become, I think, built on our values, norms, laws, and it will hold together. But if we don't have it, we're going to get less students. Well, North Dakota doesn't have a metaverse. I'm not going to go to school there. Hey, you know, when you're in North Dakota metaverse, there is no underage romantic interactions on the internet you have to both be 21 or you know what i'm saying think about that there's countries that want to legalize um what's the word of having uh relations with people underage um what's that yeah they, they they want in holland they've had a movement to do this a couple times would you want i wouldn't want my granddaughters be able to go to a site like that right and so so that's the type of things we're talking about that i would you know for those of you in the social sciences what does this mean for North Dakota? But it's not going to go away. It's going to be there. We're going to have to create something. And South Dakota's already, I think, they're going there ahead of us. So, back when Al Gore was inventing the internet, and, uh, people were having conversations about what. You know, Thank you, Doctor. We had this, this sand conversation. Yeah. The metaverse is just okay. more embodied, okay. more okay. senses. Okay. It's not going to be. It can't be one place anymore. Than the internet yeah. ended up. Yes, mm -hmm. it'll be just as diverse. 
it, it, yeah. like new platforms we never thought about that you can go back and forth on. Yeah, I mean, but it's going to come, so we can't not do it. Well, thank you for yeah. coming, Bushel. Thanks for helping feed the world. You're in a business yeah. that we all can be proud of. <laughs> doing that. Yeah. 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 Maybe, maybe not the Vegas casinos yeah. proud of their work, but we're proud of your work. Seriously, thanks for coming. Thank you. Appreciate thanks it. for creating jobs and wealth for North Dakota. All right. Let's stay in touch.